Amen. All right. Tonight we're in Lamentations chapter number four in our Bible study, going through verse by verse the book of Lamentations. It's actually been a couple of weeks. Last week I had to be out of uh, town because of work, and this week I was able to drive the almost four hours to come back, and then I got to wake up super early and drive back and be there by 7 a.m. Um, tomorrow morning. But uh, we also missed another week. That's why I said two weeks because of we did the Lord's Supper. So uh, it's been about three weeks since we've been going through the book of Lamentations. Of course, the book of Lamentations is just that. It's a book of lamenting. It's a book of you know, uh, uh, crying and weeping and expressing mourning is what the book of Lamentations is. It is written in the context of the destruction of Jerusalem and of the nation of Judah. Now we saw, of course, the pattern of the chapters. Chapter number one, chapter number two were 22 verses. Chapter number three was 66 verses. We get back to chapter number four and that pattern begins again and it is uh, 22 verses. Also we have chapter number five with 22 verses. So we've continued back with that pattern. Another thing I wanted to point out and remind you of is the rhetorical questions that are asked oftentimes with an exclamation point um, being used in the clause. Here in chapter number four, uh, it's perfect timing, the very first verse, it says, How has the gold become dim? So I want you to notice that he's asking the question, but an exclamation point is used there because it's more of a statement. It's a rhetorical question instead. If we go back, we'll see this same pattern in chapter number 1 of the book of Lamentations. It says, How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? So he's asking the question. It begins with how, and then it ends with an exclamation point, but it's a rhetorical question. Chapter number two, it asks a very similar question. It says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? And it also ends there with an exclamation point. When we get to chapter number three, it kind of changes gears a little bit and it becomes more of like the personal diary. Of course, the whole book is the personal, personal diary of the man who wrote this, which in the beginning, you know, I kind of uh, was unsure whether it was Jeremiah or not. I had no reason specifically to believe that. But we saw a few things that may point to that to give us, you know, uh, maybe reasonable suspicion at least that maybe Jeremiah is the author of the book of Lamentations. But the chapter 3 was a lot of just like very deeply emotional, you know, uh, 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 feelings that were poured out in uh, uh, chapter number 3. We get back to chapter number 4 <coughs> and we're going to see something homed, on, homed in on that was discussed in the previous chapters. And that's this. It's going to talk about the digression. It's going to talk about how they were, you know, so great and so beautiful, the city, the people, how there was a lot of positivity, but there's been a massive transformation and how there's this, this vast contrast between blessed Jerusalem to now cursed Jerusalem. And he's going to go back and forth between the two. And he's actually going to explain how they have pined away. How they have just, there's been this, this digression, this slow digression, and he actually uses that exact language of the pining away. How there's been this slow digression and this continual digression of just this, this constant, you know, uh, uh, just basically degrading that goes on in chapter number four. And he's contrasting it with how blessed that they were previously. I want you to look with me in verse number one, and we'll see this theme kick off right away. It says this. How has the gold become dim? So I want you to notice that. Right in the very first statement, it says, How has the gold become dim? So there's this change that has taken place. It was previously shining. It had a shimmer. It had a sheen to it. But now it has become dim. It's lost its sheen or its shimmer. It says then, How is the most fine gold changed? If you remember, the temple was built with the, the finest gold. It was the gold of Ophir. That's what he's referring to. That's why it says the most fine gold. It says the stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter. So notice the digression. Notice how they went from positive to negative. And specifically, it's speaking about the sanctuary there in verses 1 and 2. And the reason why it begins with the sanctuary is because what they had previously, uh, the positivity was because of their blessings that God had bestowed upon them. When you look at Old Testament Israel, you'll notice that they had certain uh, you know, uh, times in which they were you know, flourishing and they had you know, just 
every luxury you could imagine. Imagine They had just all the greatest wealth that, that the world could give. And every time that they lived in such a state or a condition where they had much money and things, it was always at a time when they were in a strong spiritual state. And what it was was the, the blessings, the physical wealth and the physical blessings were just a manifestation of their spiritual condition. If they were living a, a very good spiritual life and a righteous spiritual life, well, they would be blessed physically because that was attached to the covenant that God made with Israel. But every time that they are oppressed, every time that they are poor, every time that they have lost their wealth, it is because their spirituality has degraded. And it's interesting here in verse number 1 how it begins with speaking about how the gold has become dim. And it's talking about the gold of the sanctuary. Well, in verse number 2 it says this, <coughs> excuse me, the precious sons of Zion. So verse number 1 talks about the, 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 the gold becoming dim, the sanctuary, and then verse 2 says, the precious sons of Zion comparable to fine gold. So he makes this parallel here with the people of Zion, the, those that live in Zion. And then it says, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? So notice the correlation here between the people of Zion degrading, the people of Zion you know, going from positive to negative, but also the temple going from positive to negative. If we look at the New Testament, the church is likened unto the temple. The church is likened unto the temple, it's likened unto the house of God, it's likened unto the sanctuary. Also, <coughs> Christians are likened unto the temple. The reason why is because that is where the Spirit of God dwells. They destroyed the temple because God's you know, Spirit had left the temple. Well, the, this parallel exists between the two because God's Spirit dwelled in the temple, God's Spirit dwells in the church, God's Spirit dwells within us. And right here we see this parallel and the reason why the gold became dim was because the people became spiritually dim. And every time that there was a, a degradation of the people's spirituality, of their moral life, of their keeping of God's commandments, when they, when they you know, you know, uh, uh, stopped and ceased to, to keep God's commandments and to follow the Word of God, do you know what happened was, at that same time, God's blessings were no longer upon them and they degraded physically. And that's exactly what we see happening here. That's why it begins with, how has the gold become dim? Th what this is being described right now is, is the spiritual backsliding. And that's what we're going to be you know, looking at throughout this entire chapter. It's the backslidden Israel. That's why in the book of Jeremiah, which is the same time period, he likens Israel unto a backsliding heifer. That's where this statement comes from. It's like a, a cow you know, climbing up a hill that's muddy. And they'll lose their footing and then they'll begin to backslide. What are they doing? They're degrading. You know what this chapter is about? It's about because of their spiritual backsliding, they have physically backslid. And God has punished them because of their backsliding. And this is what will happen to Christians today. So don't think, oh, this is about Old Testament Israel. No, this is about you know, God's people is what it's about. And just like how they had God's blessings, God's physical blessings taken from them, God, the rod of God was upon them in their lives because of the lack of spirituality, because of, you know, they weren't following God's commandments, because they didn't, they weren't living a righteous life, well the same thing will happen to a Christian today. Physical blessings will be taken from you, God's rod will be, be upon you, gold will be taken from you, or your gold will become dim, and you will be, you know, punished in your life, and God will remove physical blessings when you have removed your spirituality, or when your spirituality degrades. So, that sets the tone for the entire chapter because the physical punishments were a consequence of the spiritual degrading or the spiritual backsliding. Look at verse number 3. It says, Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. So there in verse number 3, when it says the sea monsters, obviously it's talking about uh, uh, like a whale is what we would refer to it as. And it's talking about the, the, the sea monsters. It says, draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. And then it says this, the daughter of my people 
is become cruel. It's talking about them losing their natural affection for their child. You know, women, when their children are born, they automatically just love the baby. When the baby is just put into their arms, there's just a feeling. You can see the glow on the mother's face. You know, I can attest to this, seeing my wife after birth. Just when the baby's put in their arms, there's just this immediate moment of extreme happiness. And there's this immediate connection that takes place because there is a natural affection between a mother and her children that is just intrinsic to a woman. And they just have this nourishing type of or nurturing type of, of, of attitude. Well, the, the, uh, the Israelites here, the Jews, those that are <coughs> dwelling in Zion during this, it says they have become cruel. They've become evil-minded, if you will, you know, towards their young or towards their, their, their sucking child. It goes on and it compares them unto an ostrich. It says like the ostriches in the wilderness. So these mothers have lost their natural affection for their babies. They're in such a deep, dark, spiritual, and physically dark place where they no longer even want to feed their children. Where they no longer even care about their babies and making sure that their babies are fed. That's what it's referring to here. They become cruel where they're just, they're not even, they don't even have the natural affection that God has given them intrinsically. Look at verse 4. It says, The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. It's talking about the babies just having a dry mouth because they just haven't even breastfed in so long. And the mother won't even feed the baby, won't even nurse the child. <clears throat> the young children ask bread. So now it's not talking about the sucking child, it's talking about the young children. It says, they ask bread and no man breaketh it unto them. So no one's worried about the children, no one cares about the children. Also those, uh, uh, many of them did not have bread. Look at verse 5. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. You know, delicately makes me think of, you know, the rich man in uh, the book of Luke, the rich man and Lazarus. It would be like how the, li the rich man lived, you know, his, his delicate life, right? Uh, it says that those that live that kind of lifestyle, it says they are desolate in the streets. They've lost everything, like unto Job. They that were brought up in scarlet, and scarlet, of course, is a sign of nobility, embrace dunghills. Now I want you to watch this because this right here in verse number 6 is where we begin with the pining away. Where it talks about this slow digression, this slow change. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. That was overthrown as in a moment. And then it says, and no hands stayed on her. So it's talking about how when Sodom and, and Gomorrah was destroyed, it was... It was overthrown and destroyed in a minute, in just a moment. It was instantaneous. When God destroyed you know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and just poured fire and brimstone upon the Sodomites, He did so and they just died instantly. But He's, he's comparing that and He's saying, And no hands were stayed on her. Now this is meant to contrast how Jerusalem is being punished. Look at verse 7. Her Nazarites, this is talking about those in Jerusalem, Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. So notice again how it's talking about this digression. Like it said in the very beginning, how has the gold become dim? So there's this change that has taken place. And it talks about the Nazarites when they were in good physical condition. It says this, her Nazarites were purer than snow. It says they were whiter than milk. <clears throat> they were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. So it clearly tells you that the Nazarites... Now a Nazarite was someone that would take a Nazarite vow. They weren't from a particular you know, a, a tribe or anything like that. It was a vow. You could be of Judah. You could be of any tribe. Zebulun, any of them. You just vowed the Nazarite vow just basically to serve God with your life. And there were certain things that you could not do. And you were set apart you know, to the service of God. And... This right here is just speaking about a Nazarite, as I said. They're just someone that took the vow. And it says that they were whiter than milk. So basically, this is discussing, you know, just anyone from Israel or anyone from Judah at all. And I want you to notice that it describes them as whiter than milk. 
It says they were more ruddy in body than rubies. Now, ruddy, <coughs> the word ruddy means it comes from a word, it comes from the same word as our word red. You know, once, uh, you've probably heard, you know, people talk about someone being ruddy in the face. That's where I've heard this in my life. They'll say, hey, he's really ruddy in the face. There are certain people that when they, when they get hot, Elijah does this really bad. My son Elijah, when he's running around outside and he comes in, if it's really hot, his face is always just beat red. Some people just become very flushed in the face. That is because you're seeing pe the blood rush to their face. And you're just able to visibly see it more so with certain people. Well, the, the, uh, the Israelites are described as being ruddy a few different times. Uh, Solomon is described as being ruddy. David is described as being ruddy. And right now it's talking about the Nazarites. That's anyone from anywhere in Judah at all. Or Israel, you could say, at all. And they're described as being ruddy. And in the same verse, they're described as being ruddy. White. And it says that they are purer than snow. It's talking about them being white, of course. It repeats it and says they are whiter than milk. So when it's talking about snow, what color is snow? It's white. So it's saying it's pure white. It's not like a dingy white. It's saying just like as is repeated, they were whiter than milk. Like pure like milk, it would basically be like saying. And then it refers to them being red. So, uh, you know, not that this is of any significance when it comes to what tribe you are from, what nation you are from. You know, people will debate about this and there's all these different cults out there that are obsessed with glorifying themselves. And that's all that it comes down to is, uh, you know, when people, you know, want to make Jesus a certain color or they're obsessed with making Jesus a certain color or they're obsessed with saying that the Bible uplifts a certain race or a certain ethnicity... <clears throat> It's always a very proud, arrogant person. And it's because they take pride in themselves. What they're doing is they're glorying in the flesh when the Bible commands Christians to do the exact opposite. Not to glory in the fle flesh, but rather to glory in the Lord. The Bible tells us that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. It doesn't matter what nation you are from. The Bible says that he hath, that he hath made all nations of one blood. Speaking about God, that we're all made from one blood in the first place. It doesn't matter whether you're an Israelite, even, even if someone was a Jew. When John the Baptist was speaking unto the Pharisees, when they were coming unto him, he told them, he said, Think not to say unto yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. Because you know, they could be real pompous, bragging about the fact that they're of Abraham, and hey, I'm a Jew, or I'm of Judah, or whatever they might be saying. He says, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. And then he explains further, he says, for God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Saying it doesn't matter. It's just your, the, the, the color of your skin or where you derive from physically or descended from. <clears throat> it is just as significant as whether you came from a rock, which you did not, of course. That's the point. He's saying it doesn't matter. You could make these, these stones, right? It doesn't matter. That's the point. It's, it's not of any importance. And that's why we see in the New Testament, we're told to avoid genealogies. And you see all these people that are obsessed with genealogies, these same types of people. And people have tried to say, oh, why don't you ever talk about the KKK? The KKK are just as wicked as the black Hebrew Israelites. They're both super wicked. Anyone of any ethnicity, of any skin color, of any tribe, nation, I don't care if you're glorifying your flesh and you think that one you know, race is superior to another, you're wicked. And you have a sinful heart and you're into false doctrine and you're teaching something that is opposite and contrary to Scripture. It's not just, oh, because I'm white, I'm against black Hebrew Israelites. KKK is wicked as hell too. You know, the reason why I talk about black Hebrew Israelites is because they're the only ones I've ever bumped into. I've never knocked on the door of somebody and they're like, hey, I'm from the KKK. You know, you know that you're of the, you know, Israel and white's better. I've never had that happen. But do you know how many black Hebrew Israelites I've talked to? How many black Hebrew Israelites have you talked to, Brother Rick? How many KKK members have walked out with their hat on and tried to convert you to the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan? Never. Not one. And I even had somebody respond to me on a comment like, I find it hard to believe you live in Jacksonville and you've never bumped into anybody from the KKK. What a stupid comment. When have you ever seen anybody from KKK? Ever. I've never even seen one single person that's ever claimed in my whole life, not only going soul any, never in my whole entire life. And I'm from Kentucky for crying out loud. No, I'm just kidding. But I've never seen someone from the KKK. You know, it doesn't matter at all. As far as the significance, and it doesn't give you any advantage. Let me word it that way. It has no advantage. But when we study Scripture, this is in here for a reason. I mean, we need to study it and learn from it. And we are told what color 
the Israelites are a couple of times. We're told what color Solomon is, David is, and we're told right here what color that they were. It says that they were whiter than milk. It says they were purer than snow. And then it goes further because people are like, oh, that's just spiritual. It explains then that they're more ruddy in body than sapphire, saying they're like a whitish red. You notice that? That's not just spiritual. That's talking about a person that's white that then can blush. Black people, you can't see. If you're black or brownish color, a darker brown or black, you can't see the blood circulating through your body. But you know what you can do with a white person like my son Elijah? When he runs in and he's super hot outside, he's ruddy. Because he's white, he's more of a white complexion, right? He's a whiter complexion than many, right? So that, it's not spiritual. It's definitely telling you what their natural state and natural condition is. People are like, oh, it's all spiritual. Yeah, what it's doing is, is explaining because they physically deteriorated, they spiritually deteriorated. That's the point. Just like, how has the gold become dim? That's physical. Then it says this. The, they, the, the precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. Yeah, then it starts comparing the, the, how the men have become spiritually wicked after it gives you a physical example. So this is physical, and you know what? The Bible teaches that the Israelites were more white than they were black. They were, white, they were white, and they were white enough to where you could see the, the, the blood in their bodies. Because that's what ruddy means. The, the phrase ruddy is almost only used now. It's, it's almost uh, 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 exclusively used to talk about someone being ruddy in the face. And the spelling, ru, it comes from red. Ruddy, red. That's what it comes from, the same word that our word red comes from, a Latin word. So that's what it means when it says they're ruddy in body. Then rubies, what color are rubies? Red. Pol their polishing was of sapphire. It's red. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. So notice how they're naturally white and because of everything they went through, they become black. Have you ever seen like in movies when they'll depict people after they went through like a disaster? They're in a famine. They don't have food. They're dying. They're starving. You know, they're just going through. They've been fighting. Their clothes are all torn off. How they'll have like a darker complexion. This will, you know, famines especially, if you look it up, it physically causes your body to become darker. I don't know if it's because of shadows or what exactly it is, but famines themselves, and that's what this is discussing right there, it's talking about them being withered. Maybe it's the complexion of the bones, I'm not exactly sure, but they were white and then they became black. Now, of course, the Bible is using exaggeratory language, because people are like, are you trying to tell me? I've heard people say this. That they were whiter than snow and now they're blacker than coal? Well, number one, the Bible's telling you that. Number one. But number two, of course it's exaggeratory language. It's meant to be exaggeratory language. My best friend growing up, name was Chris Addy. And I would say he was black. But he was not even close to being black. He was actually very light-skinned. But we call... We, everyone would say he's black, right? We even do this today is my point. He's not black like a permanent marker's black or black like coal is black. He was very, very light-skinned actually. But he was still obviously African-American. But we'd say he's black. We even do this today. It's exaggeratory language, but it still shows that they had to have been closer to white than they were black to even say they were white and now they've become black. Yeah, of course they're not literally black like coal. They didn't go from like from like the, the, the white on my Bible to the black ink. Like, yeah, they didn't change like that. You see them and they're like white like a ghost and the next time you see them they're just like pitch black. No, it's, it's exaggeratory. Like the Bible very often uses exaggeratory language to prove a point. And that's what it's doing. It's trying to emphasize how they've degraded here. You know, but it's in the Bible for a reason too. So I'm going to preach it. I don't care if people think I'm a racist because I preach that the Bible says that, that the Israelites were white. That's what the Bible teaches. So too stinking bad. It doesn't matter. You know what? If I was black, I'd preach he was white too because whatever the Bible teaches, that's what I'm going to preach. And I don't care whether you like it or not. Verse number 9 says this. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. Notice how again it's talking about the, the famine, but, but notice what it says there. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. Being slain with a sword or being killed with a sword, is that instantaneous? Would you die immediately or would you slowly die? You'd die immediately, wouldn't you? If somebody slew you with a sword, they'd stab you and be dead immediately or, or cut your you know, head off. I don't want to be too gruesome or something crazy, right? That happens in war. Gavin smiled real big when I said that. He's thinking about war, or, you know, fighting with swords, you know. It would be an instantaneous fatality, right? 
Well, let me ask you this. What about those that be slain with hunger? Is that slow or is that fast? It's slow. When Sodom and Gomorrah, it was overthrown in a minute. And then it says, and no hand stayed on her. I want you to notice how it's saying that this punishment that they've received is, is, is slow. And they're pining away and it's a slow digression. Like we saw the digression of from white to black, from gold to dim, from, like we're seeing here, the digression of being slain with hunger. Then it goes on and says, look at this, for these pine away stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. Notice it says that they pine away. Now the word pine means to degrade. It means to diminish or slowly to decline. That's what it means. You know, the way to remember it, you could say like a pine tree, and it's kind of like how it goes down at an angle. It means to degrade, pining or pine away. So it's saying the way that we're being punished is we're pining away. That's a good way to uh, summarize this chapter. <clears throat> Look at verse 10. The hands of the pitiful woman have sodden their own children. Now, to sodden something means to boil it. And what it's talking about is saying that they, they boiled their children and ate their children. And this has happened in famines in many countries and in many nations when they've, they've had to do this. And this is horribly wicked, terribly wicked. It's actually one of the curses from God. And that is what's taking place here is God told them that if you turn on me, if you, if you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you break my, my uh, covenant that I've made with you, he gave them a big long list of curses that would come upon them. And this is one of them. It said they saw their own children. It says they were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. It's horribly wicked. I can't even imagine something so evil and dark and wicked taking place. But remember, these women are without natural affection. Their baby's crying to them to feed them. It's starving. Its, it's tongue is cleaving to the roof of its mouth. And it's just not interested. The women are just not interested. You know, I'm sure women you know, that are hearing this, mothers that are hearing this, are thinking, you know, that I can't imagine that. You know, it's trying to express and emphasize what's going on here. They've lost their natural affection for their child. They're not interested in feeding their child. They, you know, it goes so far as they are boiling their children and eating their children. It's horrible. Look at verse 11. The Lord hath accomplished his fury. So notice what we just spoke about is God's fury. He hath poured out his fierce anger and hath kindled a fire in Zion and it hath devoured the foundations thereof. The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary, that's like the enemy, and the enemy, notice it repeats itself, should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. This is talking about Babylon. When they broke the gates down, they came in. And they invaded the city, slew people, took many captives. It's saying that no one would have believed that the adversary, the enemy, would have came into the gates of Jerusalem. Why? Well, think about it in the time of Solomon. I mean, they reigned over many kings. You know, at the time of Solomon, they were a dynasty. They were, you know, uh, Jerusalem was massively powerful and wealthy and just had massive influence. And the kings of the earth looked up to Solomon. They sent riches and, and honor and all different types of thing, things to Solomon. And here we see it talking about that and it's saying that the kings of the earth would have never believed. Do you think the kings of the earth would have believed when they, the kings that lived concurrent with Solomon at the same time they were contemporaries with Solomon? Do you think they could have imagined what took place with Babylon? Busting down the gates and coming in when Solomon's basically on top of the world and ruling and reigning over everyone? Of course not. Look at what it says in verse 13. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. Notice in verse number 13 it's repeated. And we read this verse in chapter number 1. It tells us why all of this happened. Why did all this come on Jerusalem? Was it just coincidence? What was it? Were they, were they just not as good in battle? Now, the Bible's very clear that it was a punishment because of their sin. And notice in verse 13, it mentions the leaders, the spiritual leaders, and it says, For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. Now, it shows you the importance of the fact that he singles out the spiritual leaders here. It shows you the, the importance of the spiritual, the, the position of being a spiritual leader and also the responsibility of being a spiritual leader. How important that is that he singles them out here and he says that one of the reasons why I punished you is because of the sins and the iniquities of the prophets 
and of the priests. These are the spiritual leaders. And it says that, that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. This is one thing that God constantly is, is uh, 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 you know, attacking and rebuking the priests and the prophets for, and that is taking advantage of the weak. And, and, the, and what happens is they take reward, right? They, they are blinded by a gift. They'll receive a gift. It's just like lobbying that takes place today. There's nothing different, right? You know, you have all of the vaccination companies, right? That everybody's talking about that right now. What will the vaccination companies do so that, what did they do so that the act was passed in the United States of America so that there was no litigation that was even possible against them? They could never be sued. What did they do? They paid a bunch of money to the Congress. Of course that's what they did. And then there are laws that are passed that say, hey, you can never sue Merck. You can never sue, you know, whoever, I can't remember what they are, the other vaccination companies. It's, you're not allowed. Even if they put cyanide, think about that. Even if they put cyanide into a vial and shot your kid up with it, accidentally, you can't sue them. You can never take them to court. They will never be held responsible. They will never be held liable. You know, kind of getting off track a little bit there, but that's, it's a crazy, but that's how it works, where people will, uh, the reward will blind, you know, the judge. And right here, he's, he's rebuking the priests and the prophets. And notice how he says, you slew the just in the midst of her. What, it's just like with uh, Nabal, right? Nabal's vineyard, same exact thing happened. Just for a little bit of money, went in there and he stole what he needed. That's how, that's how it works. They pay people off. That's exactly how it works. And that's what the, the spiritual leaders would do. If you're ever in a position of being a spiritual leader, you need to guard yourself from this. You need to never allow anyone to try to, you know, uh, 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 you know persuade you in your decision in any way and never receive any kind of gift from someone, especially in the midst of, you know, obviously it's not bad to get gifts, but specifically in the context of getting a gift when you're judging between two people. Or there's something going on in the future or something like that. Or maybe if a person has given you gifts or, or, or done, you know, bought you things in the past or something like that, and now you're having to judge between them and another person, that should never blind you. Because oftentimes that will blind the eyes of the ruler. You should never, you should, you should always judge based upon right and wrong. In verse 14 it says, They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, They shall no more sojourn there. So notice that the priests here, that people are trying to touch the, the priest's garments. And, you know, what I, the way that I would interpret this is basically they're wanting a blessing, right? When Jesus, when they touch Jesus' you know, uh, garment, you know, of course, it, with him, he's the son of God. Virtue went out of him. And they received a blessing. Even the same thing from Peter. You know, they're basically trying to grab a hold of their garments and have them pray or have something, you know, from them just to bless them. And they're trying to grab a hold of it. It says that the priests went and they dipped their garments in blood so that they could say, I'm unclean, you can't touch me. While the people are crying and they're all, you know, famished, they're starving, they're hungry, they're bloody, they're diseased. I mean, they're just, they're just in a horrible state. And then these people, the priests walk by and they're still in their holy garments. They still look well and they've dipped their, their, their garments in blood while everyone's just running after them. And they're saying, I'm unclean, you can't touch me, just to keep the people away from them. That's what's going on here. Verse 16, the anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. <coughs> they respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end is come. Notice this is very dark and dreary and very, it's, very, it's just very hopeless. Notice how he words that he says, our end is near. Our days are fulfilled saying they're done. We're, 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 we're a goner. And then he says, for our end is come. Turn around now, Elijah, right now, and get your arms out of your shirt. He says, our end is come. So notice how it's very dark, it's very ominous, it's very dreary. The, you know, I would describe it perfectly as being hopeless. Saying it's over, that's what he's saying. There is no hope. That's his point here. Our end is come. 
<clears throat> it's also very strange. It says they hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. What's that saying? The, the Babylon had soldiers that were basically patrolling their streets and not allowing them to go out in their streets. This happens when countries invade. Even happens still today when nations will invade. Even, even countries, even when their own government just take over, they declare martial law. And uh, they, you know, they release all of that. That's when military, the military is used just to enforce laws. Right? That's what martial law is. It'd be like right now they actually thought about releasing martial law when they thought things were going to be worse than they were. They're liars, of course. They're, uh, releasing the military to enforce laws and not allow people out in the streets. You know, that's what martial law would be. And that's what's going on here is they're, they're patrolling the streets, the military soldiers, and they're not allowing people in the streets. <clears throat> Look at verse 19. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. That's the way that Babylon was actually described in the book of uh, Jeremiah. And that's who destroyed them and who the enemies that they are talking about. All of this destruction came from Babylon. And Jeremiah actually described them uh, just as that way. That they were swifter than the eagles. Not only that, in the book of Deuteronomy... Uh, in Deuteronomy 28, chapter number 28, when God gives the curses, where I had mentioned earlier, He mentions how uh, uh, the mothers will eat their own flesh, their, their own children. Right, because of the, the, the destruction and the famines and uh, being besieged by other nations. When He describes the nation that He's going to bring against them to bring this punishment, they are described as being swifter than an eagle. So you see how exact God is when he, when he promises, when He makes a promise, hey, I'll bless you if you do this, this, and this, and I'll give you this blessing. He will give you that exact blessing because God is faithful. God is faithful and He will, he will uh, uh, for sure bless you if He says He's going to bless you, and He's going to bless you in exactly the way that He said He's going to bless you. But also keep in mind this, that if you break God's covenant that you've made that he's made with you and he says that he's going to curse you God will curse you and not only will he curse you for sure he will curse you in exactly the way that he said he was going to curse you just like we see the 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 very intricate details of the mother eating her seed of the the enemy that God says that he was going to bring they were swifter than an eagle just like he says in Deuteronomy 28 that's how Jeremiah describes Babylon uh, look at verse number 20. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits. Of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. <laughs> Though a little bit of hope there, you know, speaking about how they live among the heathen, saying they're still going to be resting in his shadow. Now, what does it mean, his shadow? Basically, number one, you can look at it like he's protecting them. He's over top of them. Like he's their shelter. Obviously, God's larger. He's bigger than us. You can look at it that way. He's, his shadow is casting upon them, and he's bigger than them. He's sheltering them. But also, what is a shadow used for? A shadow is where you find relief. A shadow, <clears throat> it would be like shade. It would be also, it's saying that they're close to him and that his shadow is protecting him, but also it's kind of like where you would find shade. Because it says, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Verse number 21, rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom that dwelleth in the land of Uz. That's where Job lived. That's where Job was from, the land of Uz. <clears throat> the cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. Now, if you read the Bible and you study, and yes, i got to hit on this for just a minute. If you read the Bible and you study drunkenness and you study alcohol and you study what is, you know, the effects of alcohol, what comes about from alcohol, over and over and over again, there is a commonality of something that people do when they become drunken. I mean, repeatedly. Noah becomes drunk, and the very first time that someone becomes drunken in the Bible, do you know what they do? They get naked. Isn't that odd? Isn't that weird? Now, is it normal and natural just to, just to unclothe yourself? No. We naturally, we want to be clothed, and we feel uncomfortable when, we're, when we don't have clothes on. Well, when you become drunken, it causes you to lose your mind. The Bible describes it as being mad. The Bible describes in Jeremiah, and I, I believe chapter 32, 
or maybe 16. He, he talks about how he's pouring out his wrath upon them and he's going to make them drunk and he likens it unto, you know, alcohol. And he says that he's going to make them mad. And that's because when people get drunk, they act like they're crazy. And that's what crazy people do oftentimes. You know what they do? They unclothe themselves. And they'll run around cr like a crazy person. That's what you look like when you get drunk. That's how it makes you. It makes you, it makes you crazy. It makes you lose your mind. The very first person in the Bible that gets drunk gets naked. Right after that, the next people in the Bible, when it talks about you know, the daughters of uh, Lot, guess what they do? Get naked. Of course, they per and they, you know what they do is they commit a perverted act, right? Then, you know, uh, some of the other mentions, right here, of course, we have a mention of someone becoming drunken and getting naked. In the book of, I believe it's Hosea, it talks about a man that would try to get someone drunken in order to look at their nakedness. And it's a man looking at another man's nakedness. And it says their nakedness, and it says, you know, it talks about uncovering the foreskin. You're getting even, 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 uh, you know, more specific there, saying that he's trying to look at someone's nakedness. There is a, there is a, a very clear connection in the Bible of drunkenness and perversion. The Bible talks about when it describes those that, you know, will drink alcohol, and then what the effects are. You know, it talks about one of the things that you are going to do is you're going to utter perverse things. There is a clear connection in the Bible with drunkenness or alcohol and perversion over and over and over again. Alcohol in every way is bad. There are no good outcomes of alcohol period ever. There's only one use for alcohol when it comes to consuming it and it's for the effects. And don't tell me you drank it for the taste. Nobody drinks alcohol. You can tell me that. I don't care who you bring in front of me and they'd say I love the taste of alcohol. No you don't. They have to put other things in alcohol to make it palatable and make it bearable. If you just take pure you know, alcohol, they, that's why they put things even in beer to make it taste better. They put things in wine to make it taste better. They put things in liquor to make it taste better for taste because alcohol tastes like trash. It tastes like garbage. And the only people that drink alcohol are people that are drinking it for the effects. You know what they want to do? They want to become drunken. They want to act like a fool. They want to do all those things that are listed in Proverbs chapter number 23. They, and you know what it is? It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a filthy type of, uh, of, of you know, let's say, happiness. Because you know how the Bible will talk about people being merry? You know, uh, it'll be merry from because he was drunken. It talks about uh, Naboth. You know, I'm, or actually Nabal. I said Nabal earlier. It should have been Naboth, right? It talks about Nabal becoming Mary from the wine because he's drunken. It's an evil kind of Mary. It's not a good, clean Mary. Anyone who know, who's ever become drunken knows that it's not a good type of Mary. It's wicked. It's evil. It makes you think bad thoughts. It makes you do bad things. There is no good outcome, outcome from alcohol. And there's no other reason to drink it than for the effects. So why drink it? Why, why would you ever want to drink alcohol? It's gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be a terrible outcome. And oftentimes in the Bible, and there's more times than this, this happens a few different times where people use alcohol as a tool to manipulate you. David tries to get Uriah drunk so that he'll go sleep with his wife. He's trying to manipulate him with that. And notice how it's tied with nakedness again. Lot's daughters make him drunken so they can sleep with him. The one guy tries to get somebody alcohol in order to look at him naked. You know, you're like, oh, I like to drink alcohol. I like to do this. I like. Keep in mind, you know, there's a million other things, but let, put this also in the back of your mind, that people like to get you drunk. Pe there are people out there that use alcohol. There are people right now, you know, within the past few weeks that have used alcohol in order to manipulate someone and to get something from someone in a perverted way. It happens, it happens in the Bible. It happens all the time. People, you, you know what it does? It makes you vulnerable. Why would you want to put yourself in such a vulnerable state where someone would, 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 can, can look at your nakedness? Like Noah, how shameful and how embarrassing is that? Such a great man of God like Noah, and then that happens to him because he became drunk, and it makes you look like a stinking fool. That's what Noah looked like. Makes it, when I read about it, I think that's how foolish and how stupid you look. That's what it does. And you know what it does is, Maybe Noah drank and thought he could handle it, like a lot of people think. Oh, I can handle it. What will one beer do to me? What's the problem with drinking two beers? It's only two beers, man. That's what everybody thinks. That's what, that's what every drunk said the first time he drank. Was, hey, I just like to drink one beer. I just want to drink on the weekends, bro. I just want to drink one glass of wine. 
Number one, I don't buy that people just drink alcohol for the taste. Ultimately, you're, get, you're drinking it for the effects, whether they're minor or whether they're major, right? But that's how it starts. It's, decept it's deceptive. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Did you, it didn't say drunkenness is a mocker. It said wine is a mocker. Just wine itself is a mocker. Why? Because it says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. And it says this, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wine makes a fool out of you, like it did to Noah. And then it explains that, and whosoever is deceived thereby. Deceived by what? Drunkenness? By thinking that they can get drunk? No, thinking that they can drink wine. Thinking that they're able to drink wine. Because that's how people would try to describe that verse or explain that verse. That's how they would interpret it. Let's talk about the, if you're drunk off wine. It's not what it says. It just flat out labels wine as being a mocker. Wine is a mocker. No exceptions. I don't want to hear your extra interpretation to it. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. If you don't think that wine itself is a mocker and will make a fool out of you, then you are not wise. Because if you drink it, it will make a fool out of you. That's why in Proverbs 23, just a couple of chapters later, it's likened unto being like a serpent. And it says, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Does that sound like something that just happens? You know, that it, does that sound like something that, that you should play with or get close to? Or does it sound like something you should stay far away from? And you should not even mess with? That's the clear point, is a serpent or a snake, something that bites like a, like a, it'd be like saying like a mamba, like I just want to play with a black mamba. I don't want to get bit. Of course, I don't want to become drunken, but I just want to play with it. I just want to play with it. Do you think that that's smart? Would any of the kids think that that's smart? Just wanting to just play with a snake, but I don't want to get bit. What would you, what would you say? Should you play with it or just stay totally away from it? Completely stay away from it. That is what it's teaching. That's why it says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself right. What's that mean? Stay away from it. That's what that means. Because why? At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Let me just go ahead and explain it to you. You can't handle it. You think you can handle it, then you're deceived because you can't. No one can handle it. No, we're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. You're not supposed to look at it. It's not for, for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for princes. To drink, to drink strong drink and wine. It's not for us. It's not for God's people. That's what that means. It's not for people of importance. It's not for people of significance. It's not for... God's people definitely shouldn't be drinking. That's the point of it. It's facetious. God's wrath is likened unto alcohol specifically. It's not just any kind of wine. It's not just unfermented wine. But it's over and over again, it's likened unto alcoholic wine. Why? It, it stresses the fact that it's poured out without mixture. It stress, there's a, book, there's a, a verse in the book of Psalms that says that, that there is a cu there's a cup in the hand of the Lord. And it says, and therein, or, 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 or the cup thereof is red. You know, what does that mean? Why does it say the cup thereof is red? And then it says, and he shall pour out his fury. What is it saying? It's talking about he has a cup in his hand and it's alcoholic. You know what that is? It's bad. It's negative. There's bad things in that. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to pour it out on other people. Do you know why? Do you, do you know why it's, it's, it's imagining, you know, pouring that out or it's, it's, it's uh, symbolizing pouring out that cup of red? That also proves that when the Bible says that it's red, that it's referring to alcohol. Because it's, why did it say there's a cup in the hand of the Lord and it is red? What does that mean? He's saying it's, it's alcoholic, it's bad. And he's going to pour it out on you. And you know what it's going to be? Something bad's going to come from that. If it's alright to drink in moderation, how does that kind of, how does that make sense? Maybe they could just drink it in moderation, whatever the Lord pours out on them. No, it's just saying that it's just automatically bad. You know what's going to come from this? Something negative. Something bad. Not good. That's what's going to come from this. That's the point. God's wrath is over and over again likened unto alcohol because there are woes and sorrows and negative effects that come from alcohol and that's what's going to come from uh, God's wrath. Num verse number 22, the punish of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. Saying because he already did, it's accomplished. 
their punishment has been fulfilled. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Eden. He will discover thy sins. So then there he, started, he begins to kind of target Edom, which is the descendants of Esau. So he's saying he's, gonna, he's still going to visit their sin, saying that there's still something left to punish them. Right? I guess that's all the white people. No, I'm just kidding. He still has to punish the nation of Edom. He still has to punish those that are the descendants of Esau. But he says, God's fulfilled your punishment. He's accomplished your punishment, old daughter of Zion. And then he goes on and says, He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, old daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. So chapter number 4 was a slow pining away. And it was talking about how the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah was worse than theirs, or was, was better than theirs, because they just died immediately. But they're just sitting there and having to continually go through these atrocities, having to die by starvation or die by famine, right? You know, uh, a lot of people say, hey, the way that I want to die, I want to die quick, because I don't want to go through pain. I, wanna, you know, I don't want to die drowning or burning in a fire. I just hope I die in my sleep, right? That's what this is talking about. They're saying... And we're pining away slowly. Would you rather be slain with a sword or slain by hunger? It's saying that our punishment is worse than theirs because it's just drawn out. It's just drawn out and we're just slowly pining away. That's what chapter number 4 is about. And it's about their, their slowly pining away and their digression that took place from the positive, from the blessings to the negative and the curses. And the physical oftentimes will reflect the physical you know, uh, blessings or the physical state of the lives of people in the Bible, not always, but oftentimes it reflects the spiritual. And it's a manifestation of the spiritual. And that's what we can see with the state or the condition of Jerusalem. And of course, I, as I've concluded with each week, what we learn from the most is the whole book of Lamentations was because, remember, it was because it's said specifically there, the sins of the prophets and of the priests. It was the consequences of sin. This is what happens when you sin. You see the punishments? This is God's wrath and He's righteous to do so, to punish us for our iniquities. This is why we need to make sure that we guard ourselves from sin, we stay away from sin, so that we can stay away from the consequences that are attached to it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, uh, for the book of Lamentations, for the warnings, dear God. We ask you that you would be with us, that you would bless everyone here, that we would take heed, that we would stay away from, from red wine or alcohol, dear Lord. And uh, we love you so much, and just uh, bless us and help us to love your word. And as I said, once more, to take heed unto it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.